Thank you, Lord. Woo. It's a good day to be alive in Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a very good day to be alive in him. Because in him, uh, we live and we move and we have our being. This is Father's Day. And, you know, you, and there's a, I'm going to try to parallel God the Father and earthly fathers today and, and tell you uh, a little bit about how the enemy has tricked us and, and deceived us and how, how about how God is, is ready to move. God wanted a family. So he created man, and uh, he wanted to have a relationship, and uh, he trusted man enough to give him a free will, because he knew that he would have a remnant of people who would follow him and chase after him uh, with everything w within them. And so God was even willing, it's an amazing part, uh, to send his own son. He knew that before he made us that he would have to give his own son, that he would have this remnant of people that he would adore and that he would chase after, that, that he would just love with an abandon. You know, just like uh, when I look up here, my son and my grandkids are, are here this morning and, and what that looks like and, and, and the love that we have for them. My Bible says if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more of our Heavenly Father. I'm going to start out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Wow. And most of us, this is how we respond to what God's calling is. Oh, Lord, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. Uh, that word youth doesn't mean that you're, you're young necessarily as, as a, a teenager uh, or a young adult, but it, it, you can be 100 years old and be young in the Lord, not knowing who you are or, or what he's called you to do. So what, he, what we, we say to him, no matter what our age is, we begin to say, Lord, I cannot speak. For you should, but do not say, but the Lord is saying back, do not say I'm of youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Why? Because this is what God wants you to do. And, and, and in the verse 9 and in the 10, behold, I have put my word in your mouth. See, I have, I have this day set you over nations. I have set you over kingdoms. I have called you to root out and pull down strongholds to destroy and throw down the enemy and to build and to plant the heavens here on earth. So this is a commissioning that God had in us before we were even born. In, in our mother's womb, our father called us to be a prophet to the nations. My Bible says that, that, that you are children of the prophets. What, what, I mean, in our own mind, we're, we're thinking, no, that can't be because I'm not called to be a prophet. That's just for prophets. I'm not a prophet. Really? Who, who do you have inside you? Do you have Jesus inside of you? Is he the greatest prophet of all times? If, if you're carrying the greatest prophet of all times in you, can he prophesy out through you? Can he call and speak and use your mouth? I have put my word in your mouth so that you may plant the heavens. Isaiah 51. In me is the kingdom of God. In me is Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father God, all the attributes of the kingdom is within me. I might not have silver or gold or much possession, but such as I have, I can give you. And what do I have? Everything. Because my daddy owns everything. I have everything. I have everything that pertains to godliness. I have all his attributes. It was a marvelous thing, and yet a humbling thing, that God would say that about us, that we would be like Jeremiah and say, whoa, 
Or we would be like Gideon and say, whoa, I'm least, I'm not worthy. And God is speaking, I call it a sandstorm. His thoughts are us are like the grains of the sand of the sea. We're in this sandstorm and we're hardly picking up any of the grains that are hitting us. If I'm his son and he's my father, he says my sheep know my voice. If we know his voice, he speaks to us. So prophecy's not a spooky thing. It's just saying what God is saying. That's all. We are the sons of the prophet. I have called you to be my sons, my heir, my joint heir. I have called you to be kings and priests. I don't know about you, but those thoughts humble me. Those thoughts bring me to my knees. An unexpected gift, an unexpected love, an unexpected grace and mercy. Unexpected because I did not deserve any of it. But yet my God, being so gracious to me, covered me with the blood of Jesus Christ and called me to be seated at his right hand in Christ Jesus. Far by principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places. He's called me, ordained me, sanctified me, justified me with the blood of Jesus Christ. What kind of God would do that? Who am I that King Jesus would bleed and die for me? Wow. Can you imagine that? What kind of God was we, we serve who would be willing to bleed and die for you, Scott, and yet sanctify you, justify you, ordain you, call you, form you, and plant you on planet Earth that you might release him? Wow. What a daddy. What a father. Now, people get offended when I call him daddy. Yeah. I used to know him as master. <laughs> Task master. I'm going to mess up. He's going to whack. <laughs> then I found out he liked me even when I was messing up. <laughs> Boy, did that change me around. Change my perspective. If he gave his son for me, why would he hold back anything else from me? The problem of it is we don't understand grace and we live in the Old Testament where man set up laws and God had to come in and make that judgment, but not in the New Testament. A better covenant that he set us up for of grace and mercy and love, unconditional love. Love without an agenda. Who am I that he would take on himself all my sins? Who am I that he would rescue and restore me? It's, who God, it's all right to say what God says about you because you're just repeating what he says. And when he says, I'm a royal priesthood, I believe him. When he says, I'm a king, when he's king of kings, and he says, I'm a priest, when he says, I'm his son, I believe him. When he says I'm his heir and join heir, when he says this blows me away that he loves me as much as he loves Jesus. If he loved Jesus more, he wouldn't have sent him. Oh. What a father. God has placed value on me And the value he places on me determines how he treats me. The value that we put on each other determines how we treat each other. And if you don't value your spouse, you treat her in a certain way, or your husband, or your friends, or your coworkers. Wow. God values everybody the same. He likes me, he loves me, and he wants some more of me. 
That's the truth. He adores me. I'm his favorite, by the way. <laughs> it's an amazing God that everybody can be his favorite. It's an amazing God that when I was in my mother's womb when he was forming me, ordained me, called me, justified me, sanctified me, and brought me forth. The enemy knows if he can bruise the seed of the woman, he can rent us useless for the kingdom. This word is powerful, yet this word can get us in trouble. When we esteem this book higher than the author of this book, when we fail to have relationship with him and know the God of this book, instead of knowing about him, I want to know him and know his ways. I want to have a relationship with him because in that relationship, things begin to happen. You know, when my kids or my grandkids run up and, you know, and I, I, the other day, I one of my pulled a popsicle out of, the, out of the freezer, you know, and they looked at me and, oh, I know they're too little to have this, but I'm going to give it to them anyhow. <laughs> oh, mess everywhere. But Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh. Our Father in heaven feels the same way about us. He rejoices over us. In him was life, and the life was the sons of men. We're his life. He likes us. He's not ashamed of us. Even if we ask him for money ahead of time, even if we go spend it in the wrong ways, even if we end up with a bunch of hogs. We come home, he greets us. Throws us a party, gives us the robe of righteousness, the ring of authority, the shoes, invites the neighbors, kills the fatted calf. The dad, I just want to be a slave. No, shit, be quiet, son. I love you. We put people on probation <laughs> a lot of times. When God completely pardons us and remembers our sins no more. What a father. He is the perfect father. He loves me. He loves you. The father who calls you is always faithful. Who also will do what he said he will do with you. He will perform his word. He is ready to it. He is the roar of this lion from the tribe of Judah. He was a lamb turned lion. He is this lion that's roaring. It's the rhythm of the Father's love coming down from above. It's this rhythm of calling out. People get ready. People prepare yourselves. It says, and, and Jeremiah, therefore, prepare yourselves and arise and speak to them all that I've commanded you and speak to them all that I've commanded you and speak to them all that I have commanded you. If we can't hear him, we cannot participate with him. It was sweetness to, to the, the ears of Jesus when Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the living son of God. Because Jesus was just like, wow. Finally, somebody's hearing the Father like I'm hearing the Father. For flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. And it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing that God is doing. 11 8, Abraham, the Father, wow. Of us all, really, came down through the line, that first natural father down through generations by faith obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance he went out not knowing where he was going but he knew the voice of the lord 
Over in, in, in Genesis 12, it talks about uh, now the Lord had said to Abram, not Abraham, but Abram. Abram means exalted father. Now, if Abram meant before he became the, the father of many nations, Abram was an exalted father. What made him an exalted father? It's the same thing that will make you an exalted father. The very same principles will, and I'll, I'll, I will talk about them here. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Uh, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And, and in you, all the families, all the, fa all the families of the earth, all the families of the earth shall be, and in you, Abram, because you are willing to do this. Willing to do what? Number one, I want you to hear, Abraham. Abram, I want you to hear. Now, the Lord said to, Abram. Now, he wants him to hear what he is saying because how can he obey unless he hears? So he's saying, leave your country. Really what he was saying is leave your limitations. Leave your belief system. Leave your security. Leave your comfort zone. Because if you stay there, they will be your security and not me. In other words, God was on a mission to make him completely dependent on the Lord. Completely. Leave your country. Leave your belief system. Leave your limitations. Leave your security. Leave your comfort zone. And leave your family, by the way. It's interesting when he did leave his family that he got to take his family with him. But it was to leave your family because your family puts you in a box. They try to control you. Love always tries to control. Listen, I don't want you going to that house on the hill. It's a crazy place I hear. They're, they're a little, you know, whoo. Now, you come here and just participate in the white knuckle club, get saved and hang on to the end, and you'll just be fine. But don't go where they're dancing or singing or, you know, standing up and waving your hands. Don't go to those places. Boy, I tell you what, those people are not going to like heaven. <laughs> They are just flat out. Not, when they see the 24 elders fall on the ground, they're out of there, you know. <laughs> they're not going to like it. Because heaven's a wild place. Beyond anything that we can even think or imagine. It's way beyond anything that we can comprehend. It, it really is. You know, the first thing we do when... Our children mess up or somebody mess up because we love them. We try to control them. How do we control them? We give them Old Testament rules and regulations. We don't learn to empower them. Well, this goes and this has to go and this can't. And you can't go anywhere and you can't do this and you can't do that until your grades come up. What do you mean you're smoking out behind the barn? <laughs> You know, we, we, we begin to put rules and regulations on our kids that we can't even follow, let alone them. But if we hear the voice of God and how to handle those situations, it begins to change because love tries to control every single time. But my God loves me unconditionally. He lays out choices before me, and I get to pick, and I get to choose. Blessings or cursings, life or death. I begin to get to choose what, what, he, what he lays out for me. He doesn't force me. 
to make him my Lord and Savior. He doesn't force me to dance. He doesn't force me to shout. He doesn't force me to pray. He lays it out. And, and, and if I want to, isn't that how we are with each other? In a relationship? You want me to come and sit on your lap and read a book or you want me to come and tell you from my heart what I feel about you? About loving and about caring the heart of a father. Leave your father's house. That's a tough one. Because when you're leaving your father's house, you're leaving covering, you're leaving status, you're leaving resources, and you're leaving a class of people that you were all raised with all your life. I did a message on that whole class thing, and it stinks, really. We think we're middle class, and because we're middle class, well, I won't go there. Kingdom resources are an inheritance. It, some things we have access to, it's this access because we are family. It's a rags to riches story. And it's all about a relationship, building trust, and a dependency on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an amazing thing, Randy, when the Lord spoke to you and says, sell everything you have, put all your properties, put everything on the market, and you just obey him. Wow. I have done all this, Lord, from my youth. I have kept the law. I have done all these things. And Jesus says, yeah, but sell all that you have and follow, come follow me. Woo. You know, man's a four-part being, right? Body, soul, spirit, and wallet. <laughs> Do we trust God or not? Is it his resources or our resources? We're either in a giving mode or a preservation mode. Self-preservation. God gave freely to us. Why shouldn't we give freely to him? Everything that we have. Not money. Doesn't, he's really not after our money. It is anyhow. He's after our love. He's after our heart for him. I'm looking for people who have a heart after me. I want someone to love me. I want somebody to spend time with me. That's what he's after. Hey, Father says he gave you dominion. He gave you authority. I give you the tree of life. I give you a free will. I'm going to keep saying this to you. You get it. But how much authority does Jesus have? He has all. Jesus says, I, I give you all authority. So how much authority do you have? How much? Then how much does the devil have? Zero. Zero. He has nothing. He is nothing. When we get to heaven, we'll say, is this the, not, no, what? Not, no, not him. But what happens is that we listen to a negative thought and we begin to speak it out and we agree with that thought and the only power the enemy has over us is what we give him. Shame on me because I've given him a, a, a too much power and authority in the past because I didn't know any better. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't understand the principles of God. I, I didn't take it seriously. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. I didn't realize that everything, everything evolves around the spoken word of what you believe and what you think that comes into a rea reality of truth. You can be against God and use his principles and make everything possible. How about the Tower of Babel? People that were against God trying to exalt themselves and God says, hey, they're all one accord. They're all speaking the same thing now. There's nothing they've imagined to do that they can't accomplish. Wow. 
So God says, I'm coming down and messing those guys up because I don't want them in agreement with each other. What would happen if the church would get in agreement with each other? What would happen if we would relish our differences and get along because we believe in the blood of him crucified and raised from the dead? What would happen if we put aside whether we should be sprinkled or dunked, speaking tongues or not, what would happen if we had just come together in unity of the faith for the Lord Jesus Christ and love each other unconditionally? It doesn't affect me one way or one bit if you do not believe exactly how I believe because I could be wrong. And who am I to say that you're wrong? As long as we believe in the blood, there is only one way. It's Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the only door to the Father. We are to live so that the Father can use us as living vessels that manifest his kingdom on earth. It's an honor to be offered the opportunity to possess anointed eyes and ears, to behold, to perceive the revelation and the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Come on. He's given us that privilege. He's given us that honor. He's given us his son. He so honored us. To let us in on what he's doing so he can flow through us and turn your region where he's planted you upside down. It blows my mind, it boggles my mind to even think about how much he loves me. But my belief system of how I used to think and are my religious spirits of how I was trained and taught all my life and I would read my Bible and I says, we're not doing none of this stuff. And I, I would go ask my pastor, said, how come we're not going any of this stuff? And how come we're, we, all, we never get into this book here called Corinthians? He said, well, we don't understand it, so we just don't go there. And it, I just, it just, ah. Oh. Either God is the God of this book or he's not. Either he is my father who loves me and because of what Jesus did on the cross, healing belongs to me. It's a covenant right, a blood covenant that I have with him to heal me, deliver me, to set me free, to never leave me nor forsake me, to be there with me, to take down my enemies. That's either true or it's not true. And if all of it's not true, I'm walking out of here and I'm walking away for, from the principles and the kingdom of God. Because it's either true or not. And I believe it's true from Genesis to the maps. I believe it all. I might not believe correctly in everything, but he's taken me from glory to glory. I am changing and my belief begins to change as I have more that I get to know him I don't put him in a box. Hey. David had his mighty men. God the Father has his mighty men. He's signing you up today. How many want to sign up to be mighty men for God? Oh, all right. <laughs> Women too, you know. It's all right. There's no male nor female in the kingdom of heaven, right? <laughs> hey. The only difference between God's mighty, awesome men and those who aren't, that we believe what we hear him say and we obey. That is the only difference. Only believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God must believe that he is God. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. The more I worship him and the more I praise him and the more I, I go after him, the less I have to ask him for anything. 
He just automatically does it because he's so pleased with the offering of praise and worship that's going up to him. Because I'm starting to get a handle on how important praise is, how important worship is. I would like to have the full understanding that David had. And David is like, wow, God, this is how I used to be with God. God, I don't understand you. Why do you say that he has a heart after you? This guy, God, in case you didn't know, had somebody murdered so he could have his wife, committed adultery, and messed up with his kids. And you're saying, that's before I... I had this revelation, this understanding of how God really is towards me. And who am I to say that or make that judgment anyhow when I have messed up all my life? But God, when I had the understanding that he forgives me and he loves me in that, when I come to him, he throws it and remembers it anymore and throws me a party and celebrates with me. I've actually had people mad, but uh, you know, I've, I've seen them mad. Well, somebody messes up, and and uh, uh, you know they're back in right standing almost, right, uh, you know, right, right away because they truly repented from their heart, and, and they're up there. And and who am I to judge that anyhow? And they're and they're going for it, and people are mad because they're not put on probation and have to sit down for a year or two. I'm glad God didn't do that with me. We have to understand how good of God we have. We have a good God who loves us unconditionally, who loves us and wants us to come after him. Hey, you carry a profound and awesome call in your life completely beyond your natural ability to accomplish it. You must understand that. The profound and awesome call in your life that you could not complete it in the natural because God set it up that way so you realize it's not you that's doing it, that's him that's bringing it to pass. So you rely on him to bring the vision. See, I'm learning more and more you got to throw plan B out the window. Either you trust him or you don't. Because we judge God by the experiences that we've had in the past, and so we begin to have a plan B because I'm believing him for this, but then the, the, the last 10 times he didn't come through what I was believing for. He didn't come through how I wanted it to be done and how I was believing for and how I was confessing and how I was quoting all the scriptures. So now I'm trying to believe him for something, but I really can't quite believe that he'll come through for me again. And so, you know, I just never go anywhere. I just keep spinning around and round and round. You have to throw that out the window. You cannot have a back door. You either trust him or you don't. And if he's spoken to you, he will bring it to pass. He will have it come to pass for you. Are we king's kids or not? We are the planning of the Lord. We are God's answer. We are God's answer for where he planted us. God the Father so honored us to be his sons and daughters, to co-labor, co-create, call into existence with him to bring heaven to earth. Everything is done by words. He showed us how to be a father. The essence of his design is to be intimate with him. The essence of a father is in relationship to his children. Our relationship with him is our highest purpose. Our relationship with each other comes in second. Love me. Love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. God, begin to love yourself. That will enable you to love your neighbor. The more you're in love with him, the more you find out that you're okay. And the more that you have love to give away. Honor is a practice. It's a practice of giving. God honored us by giving us Jesus. Honor is given on the basis of who we are 
and not what we have and not what we do. It's just who we are and who we are is King's kids created in his image and he and his likeness. Daddy, God loves me just because I'm his son. That's it, period. He will do anything for me just because. I belong to the tribe of Judah. Hey. <laughs> All right, you guys, what time is it? All right, I got five minutes. <laughs> true, true identity will cause the Father to respond to our words. The closer you get to him, the more he begins to respond to you and to your words. If you abide in me, if we have relationship, if you abide in me, you can ask what you want. Exodus thirty-three seventeen. 17, I will do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. It's the preparation of the heart belongs to, to us, to man. The word of the tongue belongs to God that he places there for us to speak. One of the most important things that we need as children of God is we need the affirmation of the Father's love. If we don't understand how much God loves us, we will not make it. Jesus himself had that affirmation when he came out of the water, when God spoke, this is my beloved son and who I'm well pleased. This affirmation that we need to begin to have without receiving his love and grace. I live in a place of Continual survival mode. How many of you actually live there in survival mode? When you heard about, what was that, Y2K? Everybody started hoarding and building up stuff and, and, and putting together. They were in survival mode. Or I, I, I talk to people and, and uh, they're afraid to, to give into the kingdom because they might not have a, enough money when they, they retire. They're always thinking about themselves and whether it'll be enough or not or 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 or, or, or what they're in a survival mode i i was in a survival mode at one time in my life but if i'm in that mode i'm never in a giving mode because i'm afraid to give because i want to survive and i don't trust god enough to bring me through well all right <laughs> hey I live in a survival mode, struggling to understand, struggling to earn, struggling to earn the affection and the acceptance. This was me. I used to go down in my basement for hours and quote the word. I would read the word. I would quote the word. I would say the word. I would say scripture over and 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 over again. I would pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. I would fast and I would pray and I would wear myself out. And, and I, but I thought the more I did it, the more I was accepted by God. I didn't realize I was already accepted. I was already justified. I was already glorified. I didn't, I didn't know that I had all that. Nobody told me. And I, nobody ever taught me how to hear the voice of God. I didn't even know I could hear the voice of God. We have begun to have no expectation of God's real involvement in our lives. We don't really know how to be totally dependent on Him because we're trying to reason and think things out. We we we're trying to earn the affection and the acceptance. We're in this survival mode, and, and, we, and, and we just keep going around the same mountain, and we don't know how to be set free. Unre Proverbs 13, 12, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick, but a, a sudden break can turn your life around. Sudden breaks have turned my life around. Encounters with God. Not just knowing about God, but having encounters having his finger right on my heart, pouring love into me. Trip to Brazil, seeing signs, wonders, and miracles, praying for people, seeing them healed. 
an encounter of being drunk for 10 days in the spirit. <laughs> People don't understand that, but I, I, I was drunk. Wasn't that Jack? <laughs> We'd go from town to town. I'd be on the bus. I wouldn't be on the seat. I'd be on the floor laying there laughing. I was laughing the whole time. It was a, it was a, it was a time of my life. Wasn't it, Jack? It was awesome. <laughs> I was drunk as a skunk. <laughs> I was having, I was belling up to Joel's bar though. <laughs> it was okay, you know. He's not drunk as you suppose, <laughs> being but the third hour of the day. <laughs> oh, all right. But those encounters bring you closer and closer and closer to God. I, re I remember when uh, Michael came back from a, a meeting and he had the jerks and he was shaking because the power of God was there. I remember Jeremy looking at him saying, what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> Hope that never happens to me. <laughs> Guess what happened to Jeremy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Our culture has created five father types. I'm going to end with this. Five father types. And if you're in these, you need to get out of them. Five father types. They are a performance-oriented father. A passive father, an absentee father, an abusive father, and a good father. Most of us grow up in a performance-oriented father. Who was, his father was that way, and his father before him. It's a generational thing that comes up. If you don't perform well, I don't like you. If you're not playing well, I'm not even coming to your games. If you can't hit the ball, little Johnny's up to the plate. Bases are loaded. Counts three and two. The pitch comes, and whoa, what a swing. But it was nothing but air and strike three. He looks over to the father and his mother and his relatives, and their heads are on the ground. He looks at the dugout, and the coaches and the players are heads down, and he realizes unless he hits the ball, he is not loved. Unless he, you eat perform well, we are not like. So we're just like with God. We are striving and struggling to earn the affection and acceptance of the people around us. Because when we don't perform well, we don't feel like we fit in. Because we don't fit in, we don't think that we're going to be loved because that's the way we were trained. You know, I used to come home if I, if my grades, if I had one, I, I could have all A's and one D, and the whole focus for the next 12 hours was on the one D, you know what I mean? Or one C, or whatever. You know, it was always in the negative realm. We are a people that talk 80% in the negative realm and only 20% in the positive. So if we're 80% in the negative realm, we're agreeing with the enemy 80% of the time, 20% with God, and we wonder why our lives are a mess. Whew. <laughs> we have the passive father, the father that's home but not home. You know? Doesn't seem like he gives a hoot or cares because he's, he's out either going out playing golf or running around or going bike riding or always out with, uh, with the guys doing something but never spends time with the family. And that's passed down to them. You know what, what happens with all these? They make judgments towards their fathers and they become just like them because as you judge, you become the same exact thing. I've said things about my dad that said I would ne never be like that or it would never happen to me. And guess what? I found out that it, it came right on me. I began to say the very same things and do the very same things that he was doing. I had to repent of that. I had to understand. When I had this revelation that my dad did the best he could with what he knew and how he was treated. When I ask for forgiveness, then all that stuff stopped happening in my life. Of course, the absentee fathers, how many 
How many homes do we have without the dad being there now in America? Way too many. And what, but what that teaches our children is it's okay, it's acceptable. There's always a back door, and because there's a back door, things don't last. Of course, the abusive father is probably was abused himself or abused by a relative or a, or a friend. It gets passed down if it's not broken, this generational line. And then there's a the good father. Oh, my father, oh, he was awesome. My dad was always awesome. There's no, no one good except for one, one father. And if we esteem and rely on our earthly father just because he just gives us everything we want, then how are we ever going to rely on our heavenly father? For? In that case, the good father, good, becomes the enemy of best. And we miss out on the best things God has for us. <laughs> he shows us his pursuit of us. The proof of desire is in that pursuit. Let us pursue him with all of our hearts, with all of our might. Scott, I just saw the Lord say, your ten pegs aren't big enough. The expectations of your life and where you're headed and what you're doing, I hear see the Lord saying, open up because I have a lot of people to bring your way to bring you into my kingdom. God's going to use you mightily to bring a flow of people into his kingdom. The anointing of God on you is way stronger than what you realize or what you see or what you sense. It's beyond your imagination. It's huge. It's awesome. Don't hold back. Don't hold back, Scott. Hey. We're in this place. This day. I don't know, young lady back there in the back, are, are, are you familiar with a service like this or not? Or is this new to you? No. Well, I just see, you know, the Lord all over you. And I see some struggles that you're struggling through. And, and uh, I see the hand of God on you. And the Lord just wants to let you know that he has not forsaken you, that he is with you, and that he is going to start open doors, and he has divine favor all over you. You are precious to him. You are a masterpiece. And God doesn't make mistake, and God doesn't make junk. He just makes masterpieces. And you're his masterpiece. He loves you. He likes you. And he wants some more of you. And just, I just see, you're going to experience God in the coming days like you've never had before. You're going to be touched by an angel. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God bless you. I hope that's okay. I, don't, I didn't want to embarrass anybody or, or, or say anybody out. But this, this whole uh, group back here, I just see the word hunger. I just see this hunger for more of God and a, and a deepening revelation of God. And I see a release of, of it's, it's like a fine uh, um, purplish, bluish uh, filter just flowing down all, all over you uh, from the kingdom, bringing revelation and understanding about the kingdom more than you ever have before. I just, I just sense that, that God's ready to take you to a new realm. There's a shift uh, uh, in side of you that's going to take place, that there's a sensitivity to God that's going to begin to happen like never before to bring you to the, the fullness of what he's created you for, because he's definitely planted you where you're planted to release and bring his kingdom, to bring heaven to earth. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. You guys are awesome. <laughs> I love you, Jack. You're awesome. That was a great worship. No. Yeah. Uh, hello. How we doing? Hanging in there. <laughs> you came all the way from where? Uh, Slippery Rock. Oh, Slippery Rock. I graduated from Slippery Rock University. Yeah, so I know right where you're at. <laughs> In the boonies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I what you've come for, I hear the Lord saying you're gonna receive. And the next couple of nights you're gonna you're gonna experience God like you never before. You've come for a miracle, you're gonna get a miracle. So for uh, your the destiny that God has on you. So God bless you guys. Hey, amen. Amen. Why don't you just stand with me? This has been a good day, hasn't it? And you know, I'm I'm looking forward to the night to see uh what Billy Burke's gonna do. I've never seen him before, but uh, I've heard awesome things about him. I know people that's been in his meetings and we've we've had phone calls from all over the all over the place coming, so I'm I'm expecting a lot of pe people tonight, so uh, in a celebration. You know, I keep thinking Brownsville broke out on Father's Day. Why not my father's house? <laughs> I'm ready for a revival. How about you? Well, uh, somebody bring Jack a bottle of B12. Uh. <laughs> I take B12 every day. I need some energy at times, so... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Lord, I ask you just to bless your people. Visit them. Sign, take them places they've never been before, Lord Father God. Open up the heavens for them, Lord Father, and pour out a blessing that they can't contain. I speak divine favor over them. Lord, I just bind the enemy, that poverty spirit. I bind that. I release the riches of your glory over them, Lord Father God, the treasure of our inheritance, Lord Father God, that you have stored up for us, Lord, to flow and come, Lord Father God, as your presence come, we ask you to come, Lord, to rent the heavens and, and come down. Though I see, Lord Father God, it's our hearts that need to be opened up, Lord Father God. Whoa, Lord Father God, for we are the gate between earth and heaven as we begin to open up and trust you, Lord Father God that you would speak to us, Lord Father God, even this day. I speak healing for the night, Lord Father God, that everyone that walks in the door, I'm in agreement. We've been praying in an agreement, Lord. If two or more are touching anything, it should be done. Lord Father God, that those who come for healing will be touched by your hand, Lord Father God. We're asking for miracles, signs, and wonders, Lord. But most of all, we're asking for your love and your presence and your glory just to come here in this place, Lord Father. You are welcome here, Lord. I ask you to bless your people, and everyone said, amen. God bless you. See you tonight.